the first trend we're going to talk about is is no code and low code and really this is all around a, a common problem that's there around the industry about time to market so if i take a step back and just explain what i mean by um, low code and no code so no code is the idea of an approach to software development where there is no code involved at all no development so non-technical staff are often building out applications uh, using visual editors drag and drop whereas low code is that next step up where there's a, li a little bit more development that might be needed so you'll have non-technical staff building out the majority application and then some support and collaboration from developers to, to build out those more technical elements now no code and low code is nothing new it's been around for a while but it's it's really picking up steam and, and we think moving into 2022 that this is going to become more prevalent across many different industries um gartner themselves have been talking about this since 2019 and, and that stat you can see to the left is is them predicting that actually application development and they're being deliberately quite vague there around what they mean by application but that can cover internal and external apps that that's going to really become one of the large proportions of, of development activity as you move through to, to 2024 you're also seeing more people getting involved in application development outside of it um with uh, it's got 60 percent of those applications being built outside the department and actually 30 percent of that figure is is non-technical people actively developing these applications and i think the big benefit that people are seeing is it's not just about that that time to market but it's also about giving people breathing room particularly those technical departments to help them uh get get onto the more complex issues and, and the more pressing items so if we look at what um what you can do with no code and low code some of these are, are not going to be new that you'll have come across a, a number of these names before you've got to the left that idea of design first which is basically web development and, and you see really simple applications like webflow that are designed for for startups for for, for smaller companies to just get up and running quickly through to, to more complicated ones that require a bit more developer involvement like card stack you've got database management things like Airtable, where you're basically just giving people the ability to visualize and manipulate data without having to have a computer science degree and, and know their way around an sql database you've got automated integration so again things like zapier where you can connect system a to system b without needing to know how services or microservices work and you've got mobile app development so things like bubble and thunkable that are there to help you spin up native apps and progressive web apps really quickly uh, and they're kind of the four core examples that you'll you'll see out there in the market and there are other cases so particularly on e-commerce you've got shopify which everyone knows about it's designed to be off the shelf and, and get you up and running as fast as you can your work management so monday.com it's a really good example of that and then into the more complex items that people would never have thought that you could start to do with no code and low code around blockchain uh, internet of things and artificial intelligence so to to give you a kind of examples of, of this actually in practice i've pulled out four that i think um will start to highlight how this works to the left we've got sewers uh, who are all about waste management and for them they were looking into commerce and commerce at particularly at that level can be really complicated and quite expensive for them they need to get out to market quickly and try something out and that's really where low code came in for them was being able to develop a custom commerce solution rapidly test out the concept before starting to invest lots and lots of money into into that idea the us air force is a really good example of really complex technology so ai and machine learning but being able to spin something up quickly to get value out of it without again having to invest lots of money into the right personnel and the right the right skills so for them it was all about investigating the amount of money that they were spending on maintenance uh, and using um, a, an application developed using a low code approach and um, through c3x machina to then help them start to understand where the likely points of failure were so they could really power a preventative maintenance schedule to bring those costs down Mazda is a really interesting one uh, and, and a common situation that a lot of people tend to find themselves in where they had a number of applications, both internal and external, 
that were on a legacy platform that was about to retire. And at that moment, there's a bit of panic because you're thinking, God, we've got hundreds of applications to develop. What do we do? So they took a really interesting approach to this, and I'll, I'll come on to this in a minute about the, the approach to low code and no code in that they, they got the foundations right first. They spent time building out a composable architecture with all the services, the data, the content that they needed, basically giving people the playground that they could then go away and operate in and then releasing, opening the gate so that IT wasn't solely responsible for it. They could start to bring in business analysts, um, non-technical staff to start developing out those applications. And then that last, that last one, uh, the Zurich example, it was two things, a terrorism data capture app and, and a face quote app. And with both of these, the interesting thing is that they were projects that were delivered and driven by non-technical staff. So business analysts took the lead to develop these and rapidly get things out to market using this approach. So what does it actually mean in practice? Um, in terms of no code and low code, it sounds like a utopian dream. The reality is it's it's an addition to your composable architecture. It's never going to replace your DXP, your kind of central power and all your core systems, but it's there to, to build out the digital estate um, and add to it over time. It can be used across internal and external, and we'll see a lot of that over the next year as people are, are shifting off these legacy platforms. But one of the key things um, that needs to be borne in mind is, is the strong foundations and governance that need to be in place. It's very easy to get carried away with these platforms and think we can just do it. But if you don't have the, the services, the data, the content behind it, you start to create problems. So data silos and technical um, debt that you can't ever get around. So it's really important to, to nail that from the off. The bigger piece than that is the cultural change because you're now breaking down organizational silos. You're starting to engage with people who've never done development in their life. And it's about building that collaborative approach across the board with all these people. There's obviously a time to learn um, when you're at the lower end of the scale with your platforms like Webflow and Shopify. They're designed for people just to pick up and use. But as you start to move into the enterprise, these platforms obviously get a bit more complicated. So it's just factoring in that time to be able to pick those up and, and start to use them. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind that one platform is not going to solve all your problems. Often you're having to use multiple platforms to deliver an application. So if you think about a mobile app, you might use Bubble to build it, but you might also need Zapier to integrate to other systems uh, and an AI component to feed into that as well. It's also worth mentioning that these uh, these platforms, that the communities around them are still pretty young. Um, and there's a lot of development to be done, so there's not always the amount of help and support out there, but that you'll see over the next year is, is going to grow and pricing is always the, the warning just to be careful as you move into it. Um, so that's no code and low code. I will hand over to Tom to talk about the next trend. So yeah, the next thing I want to talk about, the next trend is uh, customer engagement in the metaverse. So the metaverse came from Neil Stevenson's novel in 1992, Snow Crash, famous book, um, and it has since been adopted by the tech community. Um, but what, what does it actually mean? So a couple of definitions here. First one, a persistent shared 3D virtual space linked into a perceived virtual universe. It's a bit of a... <laughs> Bit of a mind game that one so a slightly clearer one is a virtual world that lies beyond on top or or is an extension of the physical world and i kind of prefer prefer that as a clear um clear definition um so what what makes up the this universe so in my opinion that this metaverse represents a new frontier of online interaction where ar vr mixed reality gaming social and commerce all collide it's fueling the next generation of apps and platforms um, and it's defining new use cases for, for immersive experiences. So a true metaverse will merge the boundaries between digital, physical world and activate like all our senses. It was not just going to be about sight and sound. Users are going to be able to experience the internet all around them with connected device, di di devices like wherever they are, wherever they like. The, the currency that's underpinning all of this is going to be cryptocurrencies native to those platforms in some cases or or cross platform as well and NFTs, all of which are going to be stored in your secure digital wallet. Um, connectivity is really key in the metaverse because these platforms 
absolutely drain resource and bandwidth. So 4, 5G and 6G networks are going to be key as well as distributed computation on the blockchain, edge computing, computing locally on local devices rather than being dependent on servers in the cloud, etc. All of this is really key to the growth and its long term success. Um, interestingly, um, quantum computing technology is also advancing and getting closer and closer to becoming mainstream. So much so that Google recently conducted a, a computation in 200 seconds on their quantum computer that would have taken a traditional computer 10,000 years to complete. So if you can imagine now a, a blockchain of, com of a blockchain of quantum computers, imagine the power we're going to be solving mysteries of the universe. It's, it's that sort of level. So there's a massive race on at the moment. There's gaming platforms, social networks, big tech companies are all trying to own this space. But obviously the Nirvana state really is kind of interoperability or a sort of a single metaverse solution, a single metaverse um, solution. So does all this sound futuristic? Well, the metaverse, early, early iterations of the metaverse are already here and they're already changing the way that we interact in cyberspace. This has been accelerated by the pandemic um, and it's already delivering kind of mixed, advanced mixed reality experiences in all sorts of sectors from health and well-being to, um, to music festivals. So yeah, last year <coughs> Burning Man, for example, they delivered their 2020 festival in what they called their Burning Man Multiverse, <coughs> which was made up of eight official universes and each universe had a unique name and a unique experience that ranged from a fully immersive kind of re mixed virtual reality experience to more kind of accessible and sort of video chat focused um, platforms like Topia, which you can see on the slide here where users can interact through their avatars, watch live concerts and attend all sorts of uh, different shows. Uh, Zwift is another great example. So this is a virtual training and um, workout game. So there's already three million, I think, plus registered registered users on this in their cycling metaverse. It's a great example of a kind of mixed reality experience where users are kind of riding a physical bike at home, um, but actually that represents a, a digital bike in the game. Um, and a digital avatar in the game, a digital persona. Um, and what you can actually do is earn credits in the game to upgrade your virtual bike, which you're which you're physically riding. So you're starting to see now where this is all going in these kind of mixed um, event experiences. So Selfridge is they're also getting involved in this and having a double in this technology. So they've built something called Electric City. This was a partnership they did with uh, Charlie Cohen to celebrate 25 years of uh, Pokemon. And what it does is it allows users to interact through this 3D world by clicking on various call to actions that you can see. They'll get entertained, there'll be live music and it gives them up and then but in there they'll be selling both digital and physical clothing that can be bought. So. Uh, digital clothes that can be worn by your avatar or stuff that you can order in Selfridges by uh, direct call to actions into the shop itself. Another great example is Sotheby's, the auction house. So NFT arts has become huge this past 12 months and Sotheby's have reacted by creating a virtual version of their auction house where you can now go in and attend an auction for collectible uh, NFTs. Um, last example, of things that are happening already is uh, DressX. <laughs> this is really fascinating. So Dress DressX represents the merging of retail fashion and kind of deep fake technology uh, in order to create people's online look. So you can buy a dress and have you can buy a dress like for something like this, uh, submit a photograph and they will uh, they will have that professionally fitted onto your photograph um, by their technicians. Um, and then you can then have that as your profile picture or your, um, you know, to, to interact with. So if you imagine taking this one step further, if we have really good graphics in the metaverse, which is some of the, the latest ones we'll start to have, your digital twin could then attend an online event wearing a one off Gucci dress that's in the form of an NFT that you can then sell that address on in future. It has value. It's an asset that, that people are going to want. So the investment in all of this is huge. Um, you're talking $800 billion as um, is what Bloomberg estimate the market size to reach by 2024. Facebook have invested 10 billion in their platform. 10,000 staff are being recruited to build this, their metaverse in, in Europe. The, there's currently $35 billion worth of crypto, uh, of metaverse related crypto, specific cryptocurrencies in circulation. So this is, this is uh, currencies that are being used in gameplay and things like that at the moment. 
And just one example that the Decentraland metaverse, a plot of land recently sold for $2.8 million, which is a plot of virtual land in the in, in this platform to develop a new fashion hub and uh, an e-commerce um, destination. So how do we expect this metaverse will impact our lives over the next 12 months. So cultures are going to start forming around these specific platforms, specialist interest groups, geographies. So it's going to be great for product placement and sponsorship. Businesses are going to start adopting the platforms that align best to their ethos and their goals. So this single platform utopia is unlikely in the near future. However, there are protocols being developed by platforms like Engine and Remark that will allow you to do things like transfer your avatar from one platform to another or to transfer your collection of NFTs from one game to another game. So you can start imagining now in the future where you're going to be transferring your character from one game into another game and things like that. Really exciting stuff if you're into on online gaming. Um, so there's going to be growth in outsourced metaverse ser services, so um, which is going to be a big boost to the creative economy. The designer is going to be king again and um, you know uh, agencies like Unrivaled are going to start getting these kind of inquiries through. Lots of it, there's going to be an increased number of live events held in the in the metaverse to meet this new expectation. Metaverse hardware is going to make a revival, so headsets are going to be back, but more likely in the form of glasses this time, contact lenses in the future, gloves, sensory suits. It's it's coming this time, big time. Um, social gaming and gamified commerce is going to be a, the next revolution. Play to earn is really key. So earning cryptocurrencies through gameplay then cryptocurrencies can then be translated into real fiat money. Uh, a, a friend overheard someone talking uh, in a queue in, in Greg's <laughs> the other week and I got two guys were saying that their one of their sons was currently earning real money for flipping burgers in a virtual restaurant uh, in the metaverse. <laughs> so the kids are already already doing this. Um, and expect to, expect to enter the metaverse to visit virtual showrooms um, to, to view product demos before making purchases. Um, so a, a composed DXP architecture is great for all of this. It will help ready your business um, and it will support the creation of sort of personalized content and commerce experiences that can be served in the metaverse. Just I guess a, a word of caution, just to ensure that these, these are going to be very immersive kind of life changing experiences. So just be think really carefully before you kind of build something that uh, is going to influence, I guess, the next generation. Cool. Um, so the next trend I want to cover is further disruption by blockchain technology. So just for those who are not perhaps familiar um, with some of these terms, so a blockchain. So a blockchain is a digital distributed decentralized public ledger um, uh, that exists across the network. So see this as a sort of a fully transparent, a fully transparent bookkeeping with no mechanism to illegitimately edit those records. Then combine this with the ability to execute sort of smart contracts that can facilitate transactions in a trustless way. And it's easy to see why te this technology is going to disrupt everything. Cryptocurrency, which I touched on earlier. So cryptocurrencies are digital and physical, di sorry, digital or virtual currencies um, that are secured by cryptography, which makes them virtually impossible to counterfeit or double spend. And cryptocurrencies, depending on their use, can either be infinite or finite in their supply. So if, if it was being used as a trading currency, then you might, for example, limit its supply to prevent against inflation. Whereas if it was a utility token, there might be some benefit in burning them tokens and having infinite supply. So that it's the cryptocurrencies are very broad um, in their in their application. Uh, NFTs, a non-fungible token, you'll have heard this word everywhere. It has actually become Colin's word of the year, I think, this year was NFT. Um, and this is a unique and non-interchangeable unit of data that's stored on a blockchain. So whilst NFTs represent kind of our, our kind of digital in their nature, they can represent real world assets as well. So you can tokenize your house, a watch, a music track, and this is where the real disruption is going to start. So 2021 was a huge year for crypto and this revolution is unstoppable. Uh, Bitcoin has consistently outperformed every major asset class on the planet. That includes gold, property, traditional stocks and shares. The total market cap of this sector increased 600% in the past 12 months. It's increased from $0.5 trillion to $3 trillion. There's, there's no growth like that in any other sector. 
Uh, and many leading retailers are looking to accept digital currencies as payment for goods and services. You'll have heard a lot about Tesla and Elon Musk making a lot of noise about buying buying um, Teslas in Bitcoin. So whilst the facade's continuing with national governments like China, most governments have accepted that crypto is here to stay and are making plans actually for developing their own national digital currencies to operate alongside them and also to how making plans for regulation as well and regulation is, is generally a positive thing because it legitimizes all of this stuff that has some negative um, you know connotations with it and history with it so that will all encourage mass adoption over the next few years and the most pre most progressive governments are going to gain advantage over this over the ones with the head spirit in the sand um, thankfully the Bank of England is one of the central banks exploring all of this which will benefit us all So, other enhancements that have happened over this last year are around core infrastructure, decentralized finance, NFT mania, social tokens. So just a little bit on that. So by, by core infrastructure, I'm talking about the core blockchains, the layer one blockchains that you've probably heard of, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polkadot, Cardano, Solana. Um, these are the core chains and there's now big becoming clearer differentiation between the merits of these chains, which ones would you want to build on top of? So Ethereum's become very popular with decentralized finance. Tezos is a green chain, very popular with people with kind of do, uh, you know, carbon, um, low carbon kind of uh, development. Phantom is a blockchain that offers super speed, scalability and low cost transactions. So they all have their niche areas now. Layer two solutions, which are blockchains built on top of a main chain, um, and some and things called parachains, which are chains that run alongside, have been developed to assist with scaling issues. Things like the platforms like Scale uh, are names that you might start to hear about. Um, layer three protocols, and these are built on top of. These are where the, this is the application layer that sits on top, and this is this is where most of the businesses and everyday people will be interacting with the blockchain. So the new DApps are actually decentralized apps are starting to come out. In terms of DeFi, um, providers like Yield and ne Yield App and Nexo are offering decentralized finance products that guarantee higher yield and better interest than traditional off-chain products. So it's drawing that money into that sector now. Um, customers can now take loans out against digital assets, which is a whole new concept. Um, CBA, a regulated Swiss bank, is now offering DeFi investment products to, um, to uh, corporate investors. And people are starting to move. So as people are starting to move their savings into crypto, you've got to start wondering at what point are the banks going to run out of money to lend people mortgages? You know, this is a huge shift that's coming. Um, NFT mania. So 2021 was the year of the NFT. Like I said, it was word of the year by Collins. Uh, Beeple's uh, incredible piece of art there. First, first 5,000 days sold for $69 million. Uh, and the creative economy sprung into life, minting their own limited edition and collectible pieces. And uh, the likes of Juventus and Barcelona now are, are, have their own cryptocurrency for their fans that has that brings loyalty benefits. Um, so, yeah, really exciting time. So what to expect in 2022? So. In September this year, El Salvador took the plunge as the guinea pig for accepting Bitcoin as national as legal tender um, and others countries have yet to follow suit. But as I said, lots of countries are developing their national digital currencies now, UK, China, Singapore, Canada. So over the next 12 months, we're going to expect more countries to be announcing their intentions to create these these national currencies to take on what they call uno unofficial stable coins, which are currencies pegged to the dollar currently. Uh, this year, uh, the first Bitcoin exchange traded fund was approved in the United States, which basically means loads of corporate investment is going to start coming into the crypto space and into DeFi projects. Um, so, for example, platforms like Yield App, they've just done a partnership with West Ham United Football Club as their, as their um, digital wealth management partners. So again, this is what we're going to start seeing. Companies are going to be looking, shall, should we start having Bitcoin on our books as a, you know, as, um, as an investment? We're also going to see more retailers accepting cryptocurrencies as payments. So Amazon, Facebook, of course, are working on theirs as well. The NFT re revolution is going to continue. It's going to move this year. We're going to see a lot of stuff of it moving into music and ticketing um, and uh, the tokenizing of real world assets. So things like property and things like that. So you'll be able to tokenize your house as a and exchange houses, exchange sales very quickly through the blockchain. And fragmenting of NFTs is the, is the next thing as well. So this will allow people to own a portion of an NFT. 
so there's already now like uh, bank uh, Banksy, so someone who who bought a digital who bought a Banksy some time ago is now selling individual pixels of that Banksy product and uh, of that Banksy piece of art, and then eat, so multiple basically community ownership of that. So you can have a pixel of an original Picasso and hold that as a long term investment that you pass on to your to your to your children or whatever. Uh, Gamefire talked about play to earn. Uh, this is going to explode. Platforms like uh, Axie Infinity allows players to earn their currency smooth love potion, which is their native currency on the platform, and that can then be exchanged for real money. So it's the, the, the kids are really going to be on top of this earning some money. Um, new browsers. Uh, so Brave is a new secure web browser for uh, a Web3 browser, um, and there's going to be new decentralized advertising models that are that are rolled out across over the next year or so. So this is basically moving away from platforms like Google earning all the revenue from the from from the advertising to the actual customer who's receipt who's watching the, those ads getting paid. So they'll so in that model, um, the users will earn 70% of the ad revenues themselves in the native bat token on the Brave browser. Uh, next generation blockchains like Nier, Tezos, Phantom, they all require much less computation than Bitcoin and Ethereum. So we're going to start seeing growth in these low carbon uh, chains uh, over 2022. Uh, and finally, we can expect to see decentralized computation and, and, and hosting as, 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 as progressive organizations are seeking to use blockchain to handle processing needs and hosting as opposed to using AWS or Azure. So the big tech platforms are, are all under attack um, from this new tech. Exciting stuff. So thanks a lot. I'm going to hand over, back over to Rick, who's going to talk uh, about the next trend. The final technology trend is around carbon footprint. So it's it's obviously uh, sustainability, carbon footprint, all being really big topics um, around the world uh, across across many industries. So from from the perspective of the public, um, from businesses, from from governments, the, the awareness of sustainability is already there. Um, you've got that start there towards the left that 75 percent of adults are worried about that impact of climate change. But it's fair to say that digital in general has been largely ignorant of the role that it's going to play. And you can see that in the fact that 3.8 percent of the emissions that have been generated, which is the same as the airline industry uh, when we weren't in a lockdown, it's that's what the Internet's actually generating. So it's, it's actually a, a, a serious contributor to that. And if you looked at it as a country, it's the seventh largest polluter in the world. So there's a lot of a, a lot of space there for digital to really start to have an impact and make a change on how um, how it behaves. And that can take the form of a couple of routes. So we've got direct and indirect. You've got the more direct things like sustainable web design development, which has been born out of the sustainable web manifesto. So that covers things around design, development and hosting. Um, a reconsideration of, of architecture in general. So we've talked in previous um, events and in this event about composable architecture and bringing in things like edge computing, static sites to, to start to be more efficient in how we how we host these things. There's a greater insight into online and offline performance. So you'll start to see the rise of um, more of these analytics platforms that don't just provide analytics on what your site is doing, but also the energy that it's consuming. And so you can start to get those carbon analytics that can feed into the wider business. You're starting to see technology indirectly being used to power schemes across the sharing economy, re-commerce, um, recycling, lots of different ways where they're, they're using mobile app technology, blockchain and others to, to start to help fund wider sustainability programs. And then there's that bridging the gap between offline and online, which is touching on what Tom's really talked about with the metaverse, with augmented reality, starting to cut down unnecessary trips and starting to bring in technology to fill the gap and make that easier. So to um, illustrate this, I've got a few examples here. You've got on the sustainable web design development side, Volkswagen. Um, there are a number of examples that do this. So other guys like Organic Basics are a good example. But the idea uh, they were launching an electric car and wanted to demonstrate what, what's achievable with a website and to produce a low carbon website. So they had their standard site, which was optimized, but really pushed the boundaries with design development to create a site that was 99% cleaner than the rest of the internet, um, where instead of imagery and video, they were using um, 
ASCII text basically to construct designs of cars, really, really pushing the boundaries and showing what's possible with some creativity uh, and to have an impact on the environment. Um, Plastic Bank's an example of using technology to support a wider program. So this was a program in Haiti around plastic recycling and using blockchain and mobile app technology to help um, create an economy for some of the world's poorest people uh, while doing good for the environment. The Metail model is an example of eco-friendly commerce where it takes it, it uses AI and machine learning to help understand your body shape, your measurements, your preferences, uses that to then start creating better recommendations for you and help design up clothes for you before anything's been created. So there's real improvements on returns, on the supply chain efficiency, really hammering home that sustainability point. Then that last point is, is Lush who experimented with augmented reality in one of their stores in Japan, where instead of packaging and unnecessary signage, you could take your app into the store as you go past that products. It's not only telling you about the product, but it's launching lots of extra material to help uh, create a better experience for you across the board.